Hey everybody, uh, I'm a little sick, so I'm sorry if this recording's uh, somewhat rough, but all my recordings are somewhat rough, and uh, you're probably used to it. <laughs> this is a piece by Ivan Krepiu. Um, it's titled The Fourth International and the Russian Counter-Revolution. This is from the book Neither Capitalism Nor Socialism, Theories of Bureaucratic Collectivism, edited by Haberkern and Lippau. Um, yeah, Ivan Crepieu was a uh, French Trotskyist um, who independently... Uh, came to uh, uh, categorize the Soviet Union as bureaucratic collectivist in the 1930s. Um, according to the Wikipedia, it says here, In 1936, Krepieu became a leading member of the new International Workers' Party. The following year, in reaction to Trotsky's The Revolution Betrayed, he began a reanalysis of the nature of the Soviet Union. He concluded that it could not be defended as Trotsky held as a degenerated workers' state, but that the Soviet Union was a bureaucratic collectivist system, an idea that he introduced to Trotskyism. Um, it doesn't appear, to my understanding, uh, that, uh, it appears to my understanding that, um, this didn't cause a split, like it did in the United States. Um, there, uh, whereas in the United States, uh, the debate over the Russian question, um, eventually led to a split in U.S. Trotskyism between the uh, Schachtmanites and the Canaanites. Um, uh, the Canaanites holding on to the uh, orthodox Trotskyist conception of the USSR as a degenerated worker state, and the Workers' Party under the leadership of Max Schachtman uh, um, rejected uh, that um, Orthodox Trotskyist position on the Russian question and embraced a bureaucratic collectivist um, theme. Um, I'm assuming if you're listening to this, you already are somewhat familiar with that history, but maybe you're not. Anyway, The Fourth International and the Russian Counter Revolution by Ivan Krepieu. For many years now, the Russian proletariat has lost any hope of political power, any control over the economy, any right to organization and expression, both in the Stalinist party and in the trade unions and Soviets. In fact, the latter have just been juridically liquidated by the new constitution which officially puts an end to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Thus, under the pretext that the USSR has become a, quote, classless society, end quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat, which in fact was no longer anything but a juridical fiction, is replaced by the plebiscite of the bureaucracy, by the, quote, whole people, end quote, including the priests, the czarist police, the speculators, and the rich peasants. At the same time, in, quote, the most democratic state in the world, end quote, the terror is intensified over the proletarians, on whom the internal passport is imposed as in the Tsar's times, and who are sent to concentration camps on any suspicion. And the GPU deports and shoots as, quote, Trotskyists, tens of thousands of revolutionary workers, plus the entire old central committee of the Bolshevik party. As for Soviet society, it is developed in such a way as to give reassurance and enthusiasm to the worst bourgeois, like Mercier, and Cruy de Fouet, Deputy Robe, the army is readopting the external forms of the Tsarist army with its marshals and Cossacks. The soldier is being inculcated with the most vulgar nationalism. Nationalism. 
the factory is oppressed under the whip of the Stakhanovist and of piecework, spied on by an army of informers. Divorce is forbidden. The family and bourgeois morals reinstated in good standing. Religion is encouraged. Private property restored. Inheritance reestablished. Inequality growing. While the school children who have been put back in uniform, as in the Tsar's time, are taught to be faithful and loyal subjects. Social differentiation has reached unprecedented proportions, 70 rubles up to 10,000 rubles. It has become stabilized. The new aristocracy now can wallow in expensive luxuries, amass fortunes, acquire fixed property, accumulate and pass on its wealth. Besides, today the Stalinist oligarchy has a collective but exclusive control over production, hiring and firing of labor, and the division of capital and surplus value. Thus, it is for the benefit of this new class of exploiters, and through it, that the Russian reaction is carried on. Yet Comrade Trotsky and the International continue to deny a specific class character to the ruling Russian oligarchy, and to portray them as an excrescence on the dictatorship of the proletariat, as badly trained functionaries who appropriate too great a portion of the surplus value. Trotsky asked, take the functionaries of reformist trade unions or English clergymen who swallow up a huge portion of the surplus value, do they constitute an independent class? Quote, always and under all regimes, the bureaucracy absorbs a rather large part of the surplus value. It would be interesting to calculate, for example, how much of the national revenue is eaten up in Italy and Germany by the fascist locusts. But this, this fact is entirely insufficient to transform the fascist bureaucracy into an independent ruling class. It is an agent of the bourgeoisie. What has just been said can be applied also to the Stalinist bureaucracy, end quote. The Fourth International in the USSR, Leon Trotsky. But in the revolution betrayed, him, Trotsky himself gives a decisive rejoinder, quote, One cannot deny that it, bracket, the bureaucracy, end bracket, is something more than a simple bureaucracy. The very fact that the bureaucracy has taken power in a country where the most important means of production belong to the state creates entirely the new relations between the bureaucracy and the nation's wealth. The means of production belong to the state. The state, in some respect, belongs to the bureaucracy. And yet, excuse me, and that is, end quote, and that is the key to the enigma. Jus, citrine, and green, not to mention English clergymen, have no economic power. One second. Um, yeah, Jou, uh, Leon Jou, was a French trade union leader who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1951. Um, Citrine was a, a labor <coughs> leader. Uh, it says, one of the leading British and international trade unionists of the 20th century and a notable public figure. Anyway. And it is the key to the enigma... Jus, citrine, and green, not to mention the English clergymen, have no economic power. They get fat on the crumbs dropped by the bosses, but only their masters. The bosses dispose of the surplus value. 
but one can say almost the same about fascist servants of capital, even though the fascist servants of capital, controlling as the fascist servants of capital do, a huge police apparatus, can at times give trouble to their masters. But it is an entirely different matter with the, quote, Soviet bureaucrats, end quote. The Soviet bureaucrats hold in their hands all the levers of the national economy, all the means of production. All this is a long distance away from simple parasites or English clergymen. <laughs> quote, the clergy of the Middle Ages were a class, end quote, writes Trotsky, quote, to the extent that the clergy of the Middle Ages rule rested on a definite system of landed property and serfdom, end quote. Precisely this is the difference between American clergymen who live by collecting money from Christian simpletons and the class of the medieval clergy who lived by exploiting the labor of the Christians themselves. In other words, quote, classes are defined by their place in the social economy and above all by their relation to the means of production, end quote. Today, Comrade Trotsky recognizes that in the USSR, the means of production belong to the state and the state belongs to the bureaucracy. Thus, the rule of the ruling Russian oligarchy does not depend on the fact that, quote, it has Rolls Royces at its disposal, end quote, but on the fact that that the ruling Russian oligarchy has unqualified control of the means of production, capital, and surplus value. That is what makes it the ruling class of the Russian society. <clears throat> the film of the Stalinist counter-revolution. Comrade Trotsky senses that the, this means the definitive suppression of the conquest of the proletarian revolution. Trotsky tries to put off the day of reckoning, quote, if these relations become sta became stabilized, legalized, normalized, without resistance or against the resistance of the workers, they will end with the complete liquidation of the conquest of the proletarian revolution, end quote. Thus, Comrade Trotsky envisages, in the future, the possibility of a transition without military intervention from the worker state to a capitalist state. In 1933, that was called unreeling the film of reformism backwards. Well, now the same film can be unreeled, quote, without resistance by the workers, end quote, and they don't even have to change anything essential at bottom in the relations of production and wealth. It would be enough if the existing relations became stabilized, legalized, and normalized. <clears throat> the International Theses of July 1936 explain that it is the new constitution which permits gradual transition to, quote, the economic counter-revolution, that is to say, to the reintroduction of capitalism by the dry route, end quote. All that by the power of a new constitution. Marxist language, on the contrary, says that a new Stalinist constitution only reflects, quote, the dictatorship of the privileged strata of Soviet society over the working masses, end quote. That is, the economic counter-revolution which has dispossessed the proletariat for the benefit of the ruling oligarchy. And this Stalinist counter-revolution is far from having triumphed, quote, by the dry route, end quote. The Stalinist oligarchy had to have recourse to a surgical operation in order to subdue working class resistance. They have temporarily broken the advanced workers through deportations, jail, prison camps, and shootings. Does it follow that the counter-revolution has been carried out without the aid of thousands of executions, of thousands or th thousands of deportations, that is, without a large-scale class collision? That depends on the extreme exhaustion of the Russian proletariat, who have been deceived, divided, demoralized, terrorized on the tight solidarity of the ruling oligarchy, on the privileged strata on which they base themselves, on the international counter-revolution, and on the support of world capitalism. Bracket. 
Um, this is from the editors. Next, Crepu replies to some majority arguments, the majority being um, orthodox Trotskyist degenerated worker state thesis people. The fact that the oligarchy hides its revenues and conceals the oligarchy's true social physiognomy like every class, this only shows the oligarchy's class consciousness. The oligarchy constitutes a class which is not as closed as the ruling class of the old capitalist countries. The frequency of, quote, accidents in the career of bureaucrats does not at all stand in the way of their constituting a class any more than, quote, accidents to individual capitalists stand in the way of the existence of the capitalist class. The bureaucrats can as yet transmit... <laughs> can as yet transmit his, quote, right, end quote, to exploit the state only indirectly, thanks to nepotism. It is probable that one day he will obtain the right to transmit it directly by inheritance. Besides, it is not the title deeds to property that count. End bracket. It's hard to tell if that last bit was Cray Pew or, uh, Habercurrent and Lippau. Um, what I will say is that, to my understanding, that the la that last prediction, that it says, it is probable that one day the bureaucrat will obtain the right to transmit <coughs> his, quote, right to exploit the state directly by inheritance, um, to my understanding, uh, does pan out. Um, whereas, uh, I think in the early uh, days of uh, like the five-year plan and stuff, because they're extending production, um, um, industrial production of the country, um, that requires a degree of uh, technical uh, specialism and technical development. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, the state does, and this is called in the historiography, to my understanding, of the Soviet Union, or at least a particular historiography of it, as um, <clears throat> an affirmative action state, whereas um, the, the pyramid, the social pyramid of uh, the Soviet society um, becomes uh, radically open. But to my understanding, um, by uh, in that, so introduction of individuals on technical, with technical expertise into that period, the so-called, you know, there's a theory of middle-class Stalinism, which is kind of like oriented around this. I think, I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's oriented around this idea that um, the base of popular support for the Soviet system was this kind of like new group of people who experienced a pretty significant social mobility. So people that might have been from worker or peasant backgrounds becoming, I don't know, like engineers or something like that. Um, or like plant managers or something of that sort. That was like the popular base of the system. Um, but, uh, to my understanding, that kind of, like, openness, uh, between, like, bottom and top of society kind of closes towards the end of the <clears throat> World War II, or, like, at least by the death of Stalin, and it definitely constitutes by, like, the 1950s a kind of, um, stratum that is able to transfer its privileges not, um, directly to its heirs. So, like, if you're, like, a... <clears throat> To my understanding, at least, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not exact expert, but to my understanding, this entails, like, um, you know, if you're the son of, like, a bureaucrat, or you get to go to, like, the best schools. Um, and so, like, the a certain, like, privileges become, um, um, transmitted down via this very nepotism that's being mentioned. But anyway, back to the text. The part in brackets is over, so we can continue back to just uh, reading um, Kripu uh, straight from the horse's mouth. Um, ownership is control. The bureaucracy as a collectivity has unqualified control over all the means of production, all the accumulated capital, and it freely divides up the surplus value. 
as a collectivity, obviously, for just as the big stockholders and boards of directors are really the only ones who have a voice in running business, to the exclusion of the small and middle-sized stockholders, so also the right to unchecked control of the means of production becomes smaller and smaller the further one gets from the bureaucratic summits. Let us come to this conclusion, even if it were established that the new masters were willing to have their rights over the means of production sanctioned directly by an official, transferable, and negotiable document, it is very clear that by the presence or absence of such a notarized writ in their strong boxes can change nothing in their real class relations. Then it follows that they have exclusive control over the means of production, over hiring and firing, the wages of labor, over the division of capital and surplus value. No notarized writ will have the validity of this essential fact written down by Comrade Trotsky. Quote, All the means of production belong to the state, and the state belongs in some respect to the bureaucracy. End quote. Trotsky. The planned economy. Bracket. Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, now that I'm coming, look, thinking about it, maybe like the bracketed bit was before was kind of like a summary of uh, like a portion of Kipu's text that was like edited out. Uh, I'm not sure. It's a, I'm not really following like the format of the thing. I'm not, I don't know if I'm correctly conveying the information. It says it seems a little um these uh things that are in brackets seem a little more opinionated than just someone who's trying to uh compile an edited volume. And so I believe uh and they're not saying Crepew's name, uh so I'm gonna assume that this is Crepew speaking. Alright. Planned economy, bracket. Can such a state be called a worker state? The Bolshevist Leninist thesis continues to say yes, though not without reservations and a certain reticence. To the end, they base themselves on one argument the existence of a planned economy. But the class character of a state is not defined by the existence of an economic plan. The USSR was indisputably a proletarian state at a time when the economic plan did not yet exist. Uh, yeah, that's, you know. Which is a side note for myself is like was the you know in terms of like just the argument, I'm not really stating an opinion on it, but <clears throat> um, was the uh, USSR less of a worker state in the 1920s than in the 1930s? Because by the uh, the under Stalinism, the economic planning, um, you know, plan in quotes, uh, the um, uh really takes off and the uh destroys the uh you know the market orientation of the new economic policy um so does that mean that the ussr becomes more of a worker state under stalin than say 19 in 1925 and like the middle of the uh <clears throat> new economic policy um that doesn't quite seem uh correct just to you know not that not to say that uh you know, I agree with I personally not that you should care what I personally think, but personally it doesn't seem um like you it would be right to say it was a worker state in either of those situations. But just based upon if planning is the criteria by which you assess whether a the Soviet Union is a worker state or not, um planning increases um or at least non market uh, direction of the economy, state directed direction of the economy increases in the in Stalin so called revolution from above. Anyway, back to the text. The US, and we're still in that bracketed part, so this is all in like italics. Um, so I'm not really exactly sure what, this, what, what the status of this is, but I think it's Creepy. The USSR was indisputably a work proletarian state at a time when the economic plan did not yet exist. In a pinch, one could conceive of the nationalization of a whole economy by a bourgeois state without anything being changed in the nature of the state. See the analysis by Engels in Antiduring. Planned economy is proletarian only if the proletariat is its master, and if it is oriented towards socialism. 
Nowadays, many capitalist states strive to resolve their contradictions by putting economic plans into effect. However, these plans are nothing but partial and timid ones fettered by private property in the means of production. Therefore, the minority reporter makes note of the important difference between the role of the fascist bureaucracy, which is a lackey of finance capital, and the Russian oligarchy, which is its own master. End bracket. Historically, the fascist bureaucracy uses the police power to save the regime of private property and to main cap maintain capitalist anarchy by curbing private property. <laughs> Historically, the Russian oligarchy inherited a planned economy, which gives it, as the ruling class, unprecedented powers over the exploitation of labor, which likewise will facilitate the exercise of economic power by the proletariat. The Russian economy is neither working class nor socialist, but rather economically progressive. In um, italics. Um, I don't know what the um, content of progressive means, but maybe if we re re continue reading the text, we'll find out. Russia and the Trade Unions, bracket, the Minority Report next criticizes the comparison of the Russian state with a trade union, end bracket. Quote, the Soviet Union, end quote, the majority theses go on to say, quote, can be called a worker state in nearly the same sense in spite of the enormous difference in scale that a trade union which is led and betrayed by opportunists, i.e. by agents of capital, can be called a workers' organization, end quote. An astonishing comparison, exclamation point. A workers' trade union in a capitalist regime is a combination of exploited working men for the purpose of reducing their rate of exploitation, particularly in order to raise their wages and thus decrease the surplus value which remains in the hands of the ruling class. The bourgeoisie succeeds in corrupting the leadership of the unions and of putting its own agents in. The result is that such unions which have bourgeois agents at their head inadequately fulfill their task as against the ruling class. While struggling to put in charge a proletarian leadership which will not betray, revolutionaries obviously struggle to safeguard the existence of these workers' organizations, even though inadequate, whose aim is to reduce the rate of exploitation of the workers. And how is it in Russia? The bureaucracy itself holds all the means of production. Itself divides up the capital and the surplus value without any other control itself determines the rate of exploitation of the workers in its own interest. The Theses of the International Conference Nothing that resembles a combination of workers to reduce their rate of exploitation. The comparison comes down to comparing a trade union with a trust. It seems that there is an, quote, enormous difference in scale, end quote, between them. Indeed, what, quote, scale could lead from one to the other? And it is on such images, a simple play on words on the term, quote, bureaucracy, end quote, that the, quote, working class character of the USSR rests. The Russian state is no longer a worker's state. Thus it is that the formal property relations remain those that were created by the proletarian revolution, while the real property is passed into the hands of the Russian oligarchy. The Russian oligarchy use the real property in their own interest, and in the interest of the new privileged strata, to the exclusion of proletarian interest. To claim that this USSR, the Soviet state, which is in the oligarchy, in the oligarchy's hands, is a, quote, worker state, 
is like proclaiming Hitler's state is, quote, democratic, simply because it has largely retained the, quote, form of the Weimar Constitution, the shadow of the Reichstag, and the illusion of the secret ballot. We ourselves prefer the definition given in April 1930 by Christian Rakowski. Um, it says Rakowski, but I like saying his name because it makes me sound smart, or knowledgeable at least. Then leader in the USSR of the Bolshevik-Leninist opposition, together with Kosior, Muralov, and Kasparova. Quote, from a proletarian state with bureaucratic definite deformations, as Lenin defined the political forms of our state, we are developing into a bureaucratic state with proletarian communist survivals. Before our eyes there has been formed and is forming a large class of rulers with growing internal subdivisions multiplying through partisan co-optation, through direct or indirect appointment, bureaucratic promotions, fictitious electoral system. As the support basis of this peculiar class, one finds a kind, a peculiar kind of private property, namely the possession of state power. The quote, bureaucracy possesses the state as its private property, said Marx, end quote. Christian Rakowski. We are told that, quote, the workers will not have to make a social revolution in the USSR, that they will only have to give the existing organizations new life and democracy, end quote. I'm not sure who that uh, quote is from, but I'm assuming Trotsky. Let us be clear about this. It is true that in Russia there still remains a part of the old framework of the workers' state, monopoly of foreign trade, planned economy, collective, oligarchic, character of the division of capital and surplus value, as well as certain social conquests regarding hygiene, urban development, protection of children, and maternity, although more and more these conquests have been monopolized by the ruling oligarchy. From this, one can conclude that the Fourth International that when the Fourth International takes power in the USSR, the Fourth International's job will be to facilitate it, will be facilitated by the USSR's economic structure, which is progressive in relation to the capitalist countries. But does this mean that this seizure of power will not be a social revolution? Um, as a side note, that's how uh, Trotsky uh, conceptualized uh, the revolution in USSR as political and not social. Basically, like reintroducing uh, some form of democracy and casting out Stalin and uh, the bureaucracy. Um, suppose, for example, that the workers in, of a big capitalist trust take over their factories, or indeed these French railway workers take over the nationalized railways. They will be satisfied to replace the board of directors' representatives of the stockholders' oligarchy by representatives of the workers, it is possible they will keep a part of the personnel of superintendents. The overturn will consist in this. Instead of the division of capital and surplus value being carried out by the stockholders' oligarchy in the stockholders' oligarchy's interest, this division will henceforth be carried out under the effective control of the workers and in the workers' interests. On the national plane, it is a revolution of this order that the Russian workers will make. They will tear out of the hands of the ruling oligarchy the management of the factories of the trusts of the planned economy. The Russian workers will carry on this management no longer in the interest of the oligarchy, but in their own interests. The Russian workers will decide themselves, through their representatives, the division of capital, the part assigned to the producers, to the employees, to the renewal of fixed capital, etc. It will be up to them to rebuild the proletarian social order by smashing the social order with the Stalinist oligarchy, built up little by little, by abolishing the privileges, the new private property, inheritance, the reactionary laws on the family, divorce, army ranks, and the cult of nationalism, etc., in spite of the deceptive Soviet labels, many of which anyway have now been liquidated even on paper, 
It will be up to them to make a complete reconquest of political power by smashing the state cadres of the Stalinist bureaucracy, which they will be able to sweep out only by the armed insurrection of the proletariat. It seems that the, quote, defense of the conquest of October, end quote, is, in reality, their reconquest, and necessarily leads through the proletarian revolution in Russia. To refuse to give the name of social revolution to this proletarian revolution comes under the head of casuistry. I forget what that word means. So let's look up casuistry, shall we? Casuistry. The use of clever but unsound reasoning, especially in relation to moral questions. Defense of the USSR, question mark, bracket. Ah, I think, all right, now we have proof. When I was talking about brackets before, it was Cray Pew, because here, we uh, where it's the editor speaking, he signs it as such. Uh, Haberkern signs it. Bracket, next Cray Pew passes on to the question of the defense of the USSR. There can be no question about the solidarity of the international proletariat with the USSR, as the advanced bastion of the proletarian revolutions, in attack as in defense. <laughs> E-H, end bracket. For us who see in the USSR a new form of the exploitation of man by man, it is obviously impossible for us to consider Viroshi uh, Voroshilov's victories as equivalent to victories of the world revolution. Besides, even the majorityites justify the defense of the USSR not as the, quote, socialist fatherland, but A, because its economy is progressive, B, because the defeat of the USSR would mean the return of private property and capitalism, C, because only the world revolution can be a faithful ally of the USSR, and D, through the comparison with the reformist trade unions. To this, the majority report Reply, reporter, excuse me, the minority reporter replies, A, a progressive economy defends itself by itself, as is shown by the examples from the past, the restoration of 1814 to 15 in France, the annexation of Finland, etc. Dot, dot, dot. If the present economy of Russia is progressive in relation to the economy of individual capitalism, even if we admit a bourgeois military victory, Capitalism would no longer move to push this economy back to a more backward stage. Indeed, one which is itself striving to, it is itself tri striving to transcend. I'm guessing that means by progressive, he means that um, it's made industrial gains. I guess is what he means by that. Uh, as opposed to uh, non-industrial peasant agricultural society it's moving towards an industrial society and that what's that's what constitutes it as progressive i'm assuming is what's being said here the absolute retardation in the output of russian production would besides not permit the russian ruling class to resist international finance capital and what we would see would be not a return to individual capitalism, but the colonization of the statified industry by the finance capital of the imperialist countries. Let us take a concrete look at the problem the Italian and especially the German capitalists see in Russia, above all an exhaustible reserve of raw materials which they lack, oil, minerals, etc., as well as an immense outlet for their manufactured products and their machines, mainly with an eye to the exploitation of the raw materials resources. Imagine a German victory, or a French victory for that matter. If Russian planned economy establishes its economic superiority, then finance capital, which already holds the upper hand in Germany, will obviously refuse to dismantle the Russian planned economy in order to introduce a more backward system which will lessen the profit on capital. In the same way that a businessman would refuse to dismantle his machines in order to replace them with older machines. German finance, cap, finance capital will make itself master 
parenthesis, military or economically, end parenthesis, of the whole state machine, will transform the bureaucrats into German finance capital's employees and will turn the state production to German finance capital's own profit. The surplus value will go to new masters with different modes of division, but the statified and planned industry will remain in existence. Thus, once more, this law will be confirmed. A more advanced economy defends itself by itself. But, it is said, wouldn't defeat mean the triumph of the bourgeoisie and even without doubt the triumph of the bourgeoisie's fascist wing? Some fallacious reasoning is used against revolutionary defeatism in general and its Bolshevik-Leninist protagonists by the common turn, quote, the defeat of democratic France would mean the victory of fascism, end quote. Which means, if the workers are bound up with the defeat of bourgeois democracy, the victors can only be the fascists. But the point is, the defeat of our bourgeois has a progressive meaning for us only if it is bound up with international revolutionary action for proletarian victory. That seems important. That seems like something sensible to me. The defeat of our bourgeoisie has a progressive meaning for us only if it is bound up with the international revolutionary action for proletarian victory. Um, this is kind of an, an, um, just a thought of my own. But it seems like, um, especially certain anarchist people, um think that seem to have this idea um that the defense of states by against the uh the encroachment and invasion of other states um is somehow a uh, statist so for instance like um in the instance of ukraine there's not really like a pro a, a working class or socialist solution to that problem um, at all, um, but, uh, you know, some people say things to the effect of, like, okay, like, nation states are bad, um, so the crushing of nation, the de defeat of nation states is good or fine when it's done by other nation states and it's merely a lateral move of some kind, which I don't think is, um, a humanly uh, justified position um, within the system of nation states. It seems very, very, um, it's very, very bad for the local populations of a country to be invaded by another nation state. Um, and uh, so um, it's not really like a progressive move to just be like, oh, yeah, like, you know, Ukraine should just, you know, accept whatever Russia does to it or like, you know, um, something like that. It seems like the idea that we can just all be <clears throat> revolutionary defeatists of some kind and um, just accept invasions uh, by surrounding countries or hot, uh, um, bellicosity from other countries, uh, we can just allow that to uh, transpire. Um, as if it's just like a, a neutral, a neutral act. Just God, they're both, you know, both, shame on both your houses, really. Um, obviously, you know, as um, people who are uh, critique, critics of the nation state, um, we should not um, kind of like, I don't know, Let's just say when Poland was destroyed in World War II, it was very bad for uh, the Jews of that country and the, and the uh, um, population there. Whatever you think of Jewish, I mean, uh, Polish nationalism or the Polish nation state, um, having a nation state destroyed by another nation state is almost definitely going to end in serious human consequences. Um, so the overcoming of the state um, or the smashing of the state or the destruction of a state can only have um, uh, progressive consequences if it is initiated uh, by.
by the people within that state itself and institutes a form of uh, institutes uh, socialist measures and institutes at least like uh, democratic gains. Um, just uh, assuming that there's nothing progressive about, say, I don't know, um, the defeat of one bourgeois nation state by another. Um, if the social consequences of that uh, for the people of that state itself, in that locale, um, I don't know. Maybe that's not quite what he's saying here about this kind of like. It seems like he's kind of making a critique of. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe I'm just. I'm just rambling. Um. I don't know what I'm saying. I've lost my, I've lost the thread. I'll just reread what I was saying. Dot, dot, dot. But it is said, wouldn't defeat mean the triumph of the bourgeoisie and even without doubt the triumph of its fascist wing? The same fallacious reasoning is used against revolutionary defeatism in general and its Bolshevik-Leninist protagonist by the common term, quote, the defeat of democratic France would, France would mean the victory of fascism, end quote. Which means if the workers are bound up with the defeat of bourgeois democracy, the victors can only be the fascists. But the point is, the defeat of our bourgeois has a progressive meaning for us only if it is bound up with the international revolutionary action for proletarian victory. Same thing in Russia. Revolutionary defeatism is no more bound up with the victory of capitalism in Russia than the victory of fascism in France and Germany. In proportion, as the political and economic power of the ruling oligarchy weakens, the workers will begin to rise up. Without a doubt, part of the peasants, maintaining the tradition of individual property, will welcome the invader as the liberator who will reestablish individualism in the fields. But the other part of the peasants, for whom collectivization means tractors, will join the workers in order to reestablish the workers and peasants' power. For as for the bureaucracy, it is possible that one part of them will try to prolong their rule by compromise with the workers, while the other part will try to sell themselves to the foreign capitalism as their functionaries. <clears throat> the USSR and world imperialism. Let me get a drink. USSR and world imperialism. Bracket. Finally, Crepu brings up the international role of the USSR, an integral part of the system of imperialist alliances and one of the principal counter-revolutionary factors. Um, e. Haberkern. And bracket. Dot, dot, dot. They had, a long time ago, even rejected the cast-off clothing of bourgeois pacifism, disarmament, and the petty bourgeois tinsel of the Briand Kellogg type. They still talk about peace, no doubt, as do Eden, Bloom, Hitler, and Mussolini, but at the same time, they pushed the frightened democratic governments, especially in England, made timid by, timid by its slowness, slowness in rearming, to oppose their own audacity to the audacity of the Berlin-Rome axis, they push these governments to understand that delays can only accentuate the disintegration of the Versailles bloc and that it is necessary to take advantage of the opportunities without being afraid of war. It is necessary for them to prepare the Allies for war materially and morally. They order their lackeys to bracket attack and bracket pacifism in the Allied countries to sound the chauvinist note, to destroy all class struggle in the name of, quote, union of the whole nation, end quote, against the foreign menace. They strive to unleash an arms race in the allied countries, to multiply general staff conferences, to seal new military alliances, and to strengthen existing alliances. 
<clears throat> it is in this sense that they have rendered serious aid, often underestimated by us, to the Spanish government, on the sole condition that they keep Spain under the capitalist regime and crush attempts at proletarian revolution. With them, it is a matter of keeping a strong military place of the first importance for the French-Russian-English coalition. In this systematic work of sacred union, the Stalinists run into two enemies, a conjunctural enemy, fascism, which would prefer most often to avoid the Russian alliance, but which, it may be hoped, can be brought back into the straight and narrow path, and an irreconcilable enemy, the revolutionary, quote, Trotskyist, proletarian defeatists. Since the latter are irreconcilable, the only way to settle matters with them is violence. It is therefore significant that the USSR takes the lead in the bloody repression against, quote, Trotskyism, the agent of Germany and Japan, end quote. Um, yeah, this is the, uh, <clears throat> um, if you're, if you're thinking about this kind of, um, Uh, Russia's participation in this alliance it crushed the revolutionary workers movement in Spain under the anarchist leadership and um, was instrumental in uh, reinforcing the uh, no strike pledge and this type of repression of Trotskyism was not limited at all to the Soviet Union itself um, uh, whenever the Trotskyists were persecuted by the imperialist state the Communist Party did not come to their defense as consistent allies of defenders of the workers, the revolutionary workers movement, or as uh, just partisans to uh, free speech and uh, free assembly and free association. What they did uh, in nine cases out of ten, or maybe virtually all cases, was to celebrate the repression of the Trotskyist uh, by the uh, republics that the Soviet Union was attempting to have an alliance with. So, for instance, um, um, that is exactly what they did with anarchists and Trotskyists in Spain, but that's also what happened in the United States. I can't remember the thing, the exact name of the act or whatever, but um, this was in the pre-McCarthy era, era, but one of the first um, groups to come under political attack by the uh, uh, state, I believe, during the war, um, where it was, um, the U.S. Socialist Workers Party, and, uh, that was fully endorsed and celebrated in the press of the Communist Party USA. Additionally, um, <clears throat> the, uh, if you listen to George Orwell's, uh, book, the Communist Party of Great Britain did everything in its power um, in the Daily Worker, uh, to discredit the working class uh, self-activity that was taking place in revolutionary Spain, trying to uh, discredit uh, anarchists and Trotskyists and uh, party of Marxist unificationists as uh, fascist agents, and viewed their repression happily. So there's often talk amongst tankies, for instance, about, you know, you, know, you can debate this or whatever um, about like people such as uh, George Orwell uh, cooperating with um, the British government to uh, denounce uh, communists, even though that's kind of a weird thing because I think most of the communists were pretty openly communist. I don't think they were particularly hidden, um, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I'm not exactly sure, but it should always be when people say things about, for instance, George Orwell or something, the larger uh, picture um, should always be, we should always remember like what the international Stalinism's relation to the self-activity of the revolutionary left was during this time and continued to be. Um, uh, they supported the persecution of Trotskyism, not just by themselves, but by their allies. Um, yeah. So let me just reread that last sentence again so we get back on track. Since... <clears throat> In this systematic work of sacred union, Stalinists run into two enemies, a conjunctural enemy, fascism, which would prefer most often to avoid the Russian alliance, but which it may be hoped can be brought back into the straight and narrow path, and an irreconcilable enemy, the revolutionary, quote, Trotskyist proletarian defeatist. 
Since the latter are irreconcilable, the only way to settle matters with them is violence. It is therefore significant that the USSR takes the lead in the bloody repression against, quote, Trotskyism agent of Germany and Japan, end quote. Sorry, I just reread that thing, but now I have another comment. Yeah, it can't be, um, you should always, uh, I think the, uh, the history, the practical history, the bloody history of anti-Trotskyism within the international communist movement is something that is not nearly discussed, um, enough, um, Especially in places that had serious, were entered into serious revolutionary situations, is uh, such as uh, China or Vietnam or Greece. Um, the history of persecution of Trotskyists by uh, communists um, in a bloody and persecutory manner, um, with <coughs> a bottomless litany of lies and slanders about Trotsky and Trotskyism. Um, is uh, not um, is not discussed. You know, it might break uh, left unity or something like that. Under these conditions, one can understand the danger of the quote unconditional defense of the USSR end quote. The question is all the more serious since our theses on war explain our defeatism by the necessity to denounce our capitalist government allied to the USSR as a perfidious ally that will betray the USSR, which we have to replace with a worker's state, the only faithful ally of the USSR. The Russian counter-revolution itself gives us a scathing reply. It supply the Russian counter-revolution supplies arms, planes, and officers to the Spanish government on the sole condition that the Russian that the Spanish government maintain capitalism and destroy the working class opposition. Both the Party of Marxist Unification and the FAI, um, which I can't remember the Spanish of it, but is the uh, Anarchist Federation um, of Iberia, which is the, uh, I guess that's a peninsula thinking of my geograph geography terms, that encompasses both Portugal and Spain, which was under the leadership of... <coughs> I believe it was under the leadership of Derudi and then the Friends of Derudi, who um, challenged some of the uh, collaborationist elements within um, the CNT. So there was a lot of debate, you know, to say that there was just, like, the anarchists, um, like a lot of Trotskyists do um, in the Spanish Revolution, um... There was debate within that. There's not, just as with Trotskyism, there's diversity uh, within its opinions on uh, any particular subject, some uh, more uh, savory than others. The same is also true of anarchists, but this is often um, forgotten when blunt, uh, shorthand uh, summaries of historical events are what is uh, desired and not um, time-consuming tedious, uh, detailed analysis of actual political tendencies. Um, whether we like it or not, the faithful allies of the USSR, that is, of the Russian counter-revolution, are imperialism, and only its lackeys can be for, quote, unconditional defense of the USSR, end quote. Given this tight solidarity between today's Russia and imperialism and its decisive role in the imperialist conflict, the solidarity of the world proletariat with the Russian state could not but find itself in perpetual contradiction with its revolutionary action in its own country. Just the contrary of what happens in the case of solidarity with a proletarian state or with a country oppressed by imperialism. Under these conditions, all equivocation is a grave danger. That is why the theses presented to the conference have this conclusion. To the slogan of the defense of the USSR, it is necessary to counterpose revolutionary defeatism by the Fourth International and fraternization with Soviet revolutionaries. <coughs> this is, was originally from the Quatrième International, uh, 1937, uh, so a year after the uh, revolution betrayed was published. Um...
Yeah.